So Fritz, could you share with the audience a little bit more background information about you, the status you had at that time as a, as a Geltungsjuder? Yes. About the type of intermarriage? Intermarriage children, intermarriages, if they were raised Jewish, they were counted as Jews. All the registration and restriction applied, they had to wear the star. If they were not raised Jewish, they only were subject to a number of restrictions. That was an important uh, distinction. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about your life before 1933, when the Nazis yes. came to power? Actually, I remember it was a pretty good life. My father, a judge, he uh, got the Iron Cross and actually considered himself a German. He never missed, even taught me how to salute the flag. And uh, we had the maid and Sundays, we went out in the zoo and uh, looked at the gorilla, Bobby, sitting there. If you gave him an apple, unless it completely uh, there was no flaw, he wouldn't eat it. And uh, we took our trips. And uh, actually, it was uh, very pleasant. However, I must say, I was this Jewish, but we, uh, uh, Christmas, and uh, Hanukkah, I had the best of two worlds. Even right now, <laughs> even right now, Passover and Easter. <laughs> no. 1933, Hitler came to power, and my father lost his job. First, last day, when he left his office, they told him, go by the back door, because outside there is a Nazi demonstration. I said to my father, I came in by the front door, and I'm leaving by the front door. Of course, things, my father lost his job, and of course, the money became quite tight. We immediately had to move to a smaller apartment. And but my good aunt Elfriede, my mother's sister, really stood by us. She bought my clothes and saw to it at a proper birthday party. My mother's relatives stood by us too all the time. However, my father's colleagues, they broke off contact. I still see one colleague coming with flowers. Oh, we are so sorry, but we have to uh, distance. Keep this. We can't see you anymore. And uh, my father then took an uh, honorary job at the Jewish community center giving uh, legal advice. And of course, it was time to go to school, six years old. And there I was very lucky. In fact, my name, Lachstein, means lucky stone. I was lucky with school, great school I attended. People were very decent. I did not have to sing uh, patriotic songs. I was not harassed. And uh, the class, my homeroom teacher was uh, party member, and he treated me like any other. I might as well point out here, the fact that somebody was a party member did not mean he actually was a Nazi or anti-Semitic. What do you do, for instance, friends? The father worked at a company, insurance company. The two children, the mother-in-law lived with him. What he's going to do, be a hero? He, Therefore, he did it. Or the famous conductor, uh, Karajan, was no Nazi at all, but he wanted to become a music director in Aachen. And uh, this happened. And uh, I attended the school four years, then finally uh, it 
came time to, to leave to go to a dual school. And uh, started out at the uh, school. And there too, actually, it was in German school, German poetry, German history. And uh, I might say, this, uh, our uh, discipline was quite uh, stringent. Yeah. During uh, recess, you had to go around counterclockwise, no running, and you had to sit straight. And without, if you sneeze, to pay for to cover you up, and something else. You realize I still can do this. Put my hands into my pockets. If you did that, to ask you, going on a trip? Why? Well, you packed your hands already. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, one of your memories that you talk about is um, the Kristallnacht in 1938. Yes. Did you share with the audience some things you witnessed? Sure. At that time, to school, going to school, and some broken windows. One, one or two broken windows, but then I realized what had happened. The authors saw smoke coming up from the synagogues. And that's always a question, not generally known. How did they know what windows to break? They didn't have a list, didn't have to, because about Two months before the Kristallnacht, every Jewish owner had to have his name on the shop window in white letters. That for Paul. All they had to do, look around, ah, there is a window with the white letters. And they went to school, and some of the teachers already had to sent to the concentration camp. And I remember taking home a note. Because of certain circumstances, report cards will be late this year. There are always winter report cards. And right after this, of course, uh, already certain strictures applied. Once uh, no people who were used were allowed to drive, and already had to write in. Uh, ut, uh, Uh, um, first electrical instrument and uh, were not permitted to, to go to a barber. Little things. And for school too, you also, I remember you, you mentioning, especially afterward, as you, uh, after the war, looking back, viewing, realizing how so many of your teachers in the Jewish school you see as everyday heroes. Could you talk a little bit about yes, some of Yes, actually, Jewish school, uh, I was the way, every, everyday heroes. They said, true to the profession, we knew they would be deported. I think in 1941, deportation started. But they came to school, helped us to forget everyday harassment, actually, the school was actually a relief. We came back and every day, and I must say to me, they were everyday heroes. Yes, we sometimes played pranks, but we still realized that what they did. At the time, of course, we did not. But looking back, I owe them. Great things, many things. So, we talked about Kristallnacht, and so in 1939 is when special IDs started to be issued. Yes, 1939, I, every Jew, had, uh, was issued a special identification board with a big J. And uh, I had to tell you the name Sarah, or women. And Israel for men. Therefore, my name became Prince Israel Luckstein. And when I went to an office, police or elsewhere, I had to pull it out, announce it in a loud voice, I am a Jew, and actually have to give my identification number. 
And then in 1939, the war begins. 1939, things got quite tough. At that time, of course, ration, but Jews did not get regular rations, no special allotments. They were allowed only to shop between four and five in the afternoon. Of course, in case my mother could go and there was a decent um, merchant said, well, nobody looking, let me have your family's ration cards. And then, of course, later on, uh, no meat, uh, no milk, and other restrictions. So, just to, to recap, as you see, that's, it's, it's more and more, the vice, as you describe it, the vice uh, is well, tightening. Actually, you waited. <laughs> Every week, somebody else came. You did it deliberately, bit by bit. You never knew what would happen next. And then in 1941, the Yellow Stars were introduced? Yes. 1941, the Yellow Star had to be fixed here and had to be very careful that it was tightly fastened. There was a nasty policeman. He came with a pencil. If you could get behind, it was not so good. But uh, I must say, uh, at least in Berlin, people, there was few, not much harassment. In fact, people, I remember several times, people came on and handed me uh, uh, some food, canned food or something. I must say, uh, people, at least in Berlin, behaved quite good, but not bad. And that's, that's really what's so uh, extraordinary about Fritz's story as being a Geltungsjude, considered a Jew, living in Berlin, wearing the yellow star, and living through Berlin, through the entire, the capital of Nazi Germany, through the entire it's war. It's the, very, very... In fact, living in Berlin had an advantage because close to the power. If you lived far out in the boondocks, you were subject to the whims of the local commander. He did... Uh, whatever you wanted, it didn't pay much attention to official guidelines. And in Berlin, you, you talk too about um, the air raids as, as the war proceeds. Right. Then came the air raids. And of course, the, the Jews had to go to special uh, air raid shelters. And there was a rule, if the air raid ended, if the all clear came after one o'clock, school started late, and classes lasted only 35 minutes, and there were a sitting of two minds. We wish uh, the old clear would come, but maybe 10 more minutes, then school will be late. Children. And then in January 42, the Jewish schools were disbanded. Yes, the school was abandoned. I remember, of course, um, deportation had started in 41. At the beginning, the deportation was quite organized. People received a notice, you will be deported, make a list of your belongings at a certain day. Um, usually it was actually uh, uh, a policeman came, uh, sealed the door, and then you had to go to the nearest collection point. But, uh, Later on, of course, people they disappeared. They came to school and didn't know. Your neighbor wasn't there. I hope he was sick. But very often, actually, he had been deported. Very often, people were actually picked up the street. I remember there's 35 uh, students, and 35, I believe, five survived. Two were, three were just Yeltsin students. One uh, came back, survived, and another was in hiding. Could you uh, talk a little bit about um, your experiences at the, the, the Kosa Hamburger Straße? Yes. My mother accompanied friends to the collection point, and the Gestapo saying, what are you doing here? 
the Jewish. I bet you, you have a Jewish family. They will depart tomorrow at the downtown collection point. My, next morning, my father and I departed at the downtown collection point in old people's home. Where they put us in a room about uh, 10, uh, and, uh, were strictly forbidden to lie down. And the commandant feared Gestapo Captain uh, uh, Brunner, uh, a very nasty man. He was going around trying to catch us, but he didn't succeed because the police, regular police guard at the building, and they came around and said, get up, get up, he's coming. Really remarkable. Had they been caught, at least that could have, would have happened to them the Eastern Front. Well, it was about uh, four or five days. And, okay, I was, somebody came in. I had to go downstairs for interrogation. My father and the old, uh, the older gentleman, I just was called a well-known journalist, prepared me for the ordeal. Don't be a hero. Don't be uh, hostile or uh, don't be hostile, but answer the question fully. But do not, do not uh, volunteer any, anything. Well, I was called in the office and there, Bruno was sitting at the desk to cite 10 SS waiting, uh, listening, uh, watching the proceedings. We wanted to came in and immediately wanted to catch me. Your mother is Jewish? No, I said, my mother is ours. Well, then he questioned me and um, I tell him, at that time, I worked uh, at a, an old cemetery. And I said, ah, we're going to give you a decent job. You will report to the labor, uh, the labor office for a decent job. And, uh, out. And outside I found my father, and with a leaf of relief he stepped out in the street. And the date, 6th, 24th January 1943, my 16th birthday. I would forget this day. Could you um, talk a little bit about, you talking about the, the cleanup crews when you were assigned to these work details? Huh? The cleanup crews, the work details that you were assigned to after after this, yeah. for the, after, the, after the, the air raids? Actually, this happened after the, the um, fabrique. Um, of the factory action. Yeah, actually after this, uh, I went next morning to the labor office and was assigned to, uh, to work at the factory, I guess making some instrument, I don't, I don't know what it was, it was for Air Force, I believe. And there, that one day, Saturday morning, a good friend of mine, Gert, we are sitting there uh, trying to do stuff. The door opens, SS offer comes in, everybody out. And I took our stuff outside, was a, a truck, everybody on the truck, and two SS men at the back. And then we went. It was quite difficult for some women. It, Saturday was a half day, and people didn't send their children to, to daycare, and they didn't know what would happen. Well, we wound up downtown in a dance hall, a former dance hall. All chairs, everything had been put aside, and we camped out in the middle, I remember. Uh, after I would say uh, three or okay, two days, we were interviewed by actually some very, I must say, pleasant uh, policemen, uh, detectives. And I said, actually, you see, that get out, don't want to see you again. And there, 
scared and I stepped out. It was eight o'clock at night, and there I brought the law, broke the law. Jews were not permitted after eight o'clock outside. Okay, went home. My uh, mother was away visiting an aunt away, and I sent a telegram saying it's what advisable if you come back. End of the month, ration cards have to be uh, picked up. My mother was there. I went to the ration cards office outside, truck, everyone with the new stuff in their truck. And okay, it drove us to another collection point. I remember uh, it was this place, it was a synagogue where I had been, my mitzvah had been confirmed. There we stayed half a day and they get a truck downtown to a Jewish, uh, to a building, was a community center. But there we put us in a room, 50 men into a room, very tight, just uh, enough room to lie down. And of course, what did we do? We uh, speculated what would happen to us and stood in line to the toilet facilities, the restrooms. Of course, the building wasn't set up for the influx of so many people. Uh, after, I remember food, we got turnips for breakfast. And I remember after a week or so, call out, go downstairs, we were released. And there I found my father, and uh, after, uh, Members of the community's uh, secretaries filled out our release slip. We presented the release to the uh, sergeant. And I still remember, looked at my father, a judge you have been? Well, I think you ruined the lives of many people. My father said, I hope not to be talked, uh, we stepped out. But what we did not know, Outside, there was a demonstration by the Jewish women. They stayed, they didn't move, they demonstrated, demanded our release. That was the only challenge of authority in the Third Reich. And with the diary of Goebbels, the Minister of uh, uh, Propaganda. Propaganda felt that wasn't a good time. He didn't want any upset, any, particularly not after the battle of uh, the Stalingrad. And so they let us out. And after that, they were assigned to the uh, group that had to clean up after uh, air raids moved from place to place, and we had to clean up. And uh, was a, and the person in the crew, there were chemists, there were lawyers, there were engineers. And it was interesting. And actually, where we worked, young people, but the, the older people said, the young fellows don't learn anything. And he got some instructions. I remember particularly if you came with a wheelbarrow while it was filled, you were given a problem, and when it came back, you had to give the answer. I still remember one problem. When you come back, you will give the, na the names of the Great Lakes in the United States. And, uh, and uh, of course, for us uh, living there, the, had to, they were quite protected. We were not used to some of the rough language that was used. When actually we learned it, it was actually came. Well, I remember when I was later on in the work at the factory in St. Paul, some of the nice people tried to teach me certain four letter words, and hoping I would use them. But it didn't work because the words are uh, of Anglo-Saxon origin and quite similar in German. 
So during this time in the, at the, with the cleanup crews, you also you talk about the, um, the humor, how, how that played a role oh, in your yes, daily, humor. getting you through oh, the oh. days. Every day, we had to keep up the spirit on a few stories. Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, um, fell into a river and some young guy brought him out. Said, oh, Goebbels, what can I do for you? Well, I said, I like a state funeral. Why a state funeral? When a father finds out you go to out, he's going to kill me. <laughs> or, as I went to a Jew, if you can tell which eye is a glass, I let you go. Oh, what's that to do? It's your right one. How did you know? Well, it looks so human. Mm. <laughs> uh, and of course, the friends of ours had, had a little dog who was trained. If you give him a, a treat, and said, for the Jew, he takes it. If you say for the Nazi, he wouldn't take it. And uh, of course, my one story my father like, you know, I said substitutes. There were substitutes for everything, my brother. And the question is, when will the war be over? Well, when the British eat rats and the Germans eat rat substitute. <laughs> um, could you talk about the time when you, um, when during the uh, cleanup crew of the one area where you actually um, came in contact with, with Adolf Eichmann? Actually, something else I might mention here. It's important. I was, while I was working, the wall came down, I was knocked out, injured. And they took me to a uh, Catholic hospital and they uh, re sutured me and gave me a shot. This was remarkable because they were strictly forbidden to treat a Jew. And the good people took a risk on my behalf. I still wonder what they wrote down the record to avoid getting into trouble. No, uh, they really would forget it. Yes, that's a, an important note that the, uh, the people still had individual decisions, choices to make to help or not to help in the case of the hospital. Um, but also when you talked, uh, I mentioned just a minute ago, if you could talk about your your um, the time you came in contact oh, with yes. out of life. Uh, you mean, we had bumped, you know, bumped out twice and lived in the second time in the hospital. One morning I get out, leave the hospital to go to work. Hop! A group of Gestapo grabbing up here on the truck. You know, a special so-called catastrophe duty. Okay, the door opens after 30 minutes, right? And lo, behold, I was what we call the devil's den. There were the Gestapo. Reichmann said, Porto, he was a Gestapo officer in charge of the deportation. And, well, and uh, the left, and I was lucky too. I was a decent young lieutenant who took charge and uh, he said, oh, I like him, he's strong. He was lucky, he was very decent, never harassing, no anti-Semitic word. Others, uh, guys were very nasty. And uh, anyhow, one day, you're working with lo and behold, suddenly Eichmann is coming. Eichmann, I mean, everybody, I mean, no Eichmann. And uh, I wondered how he would look. And there I saw him, ordinary. Nobody would have noticed him in the crowd. He came up with a sitting and tried to beside me, gave some instructions and left. Well, after a week, they let us go home. Every night they were sent to the hospital, a truck, and every uh, morning again, they sent us back to the, uh, right to the, what we call the devil's den. I remember the last time day, I, when I went to work, 
I climbed over the back fence of the hospital just in case I didn't want to be uh, sent me back. Um, you talked earlier about, uh, as they introduced the star in 1941, the yellow star, and how dangerous it was to, if you were caught without, as, as the Geltungs, you would have caught without having the yellow star, but that happened to you at one time. Could you talk about that? Yes, yes, yes. I uh, lucky. Uh, when we moved to a small, smaller apartment, we had stored some furniture and items. And a friend, uh, the house friend, had storage uh, on the bottom on the, on the roof. And I wanted to get something. And uh, of course, I took uh, coming up to store, or what we call uh, usually putting a book or something, turning the order. Because uh, I kept it up and come down to the stuff. There is a guy who could tell immediately Gestapo the way they looked, carried themselves, and of course stopped me. What is a young guy doing, not at the front? And I, I showed him, I identified by uh, papers, ex so-called military exclusion papers, and of course you know, what he knew right away I, I should have worn the star. Well, well but what happened? He looked at me, the next, uh, it was an extra corporal experience. I was sitting there watching what would happen. Uh, no panic or anything. Well, he looked at uh, probably figuring out whether the German or Jewish blood is predominant. Or he didn't want any paperwork. But any, what a classmate was caught without it. And uh, he probably looked a little more Jewish, what they consider to be Jewish. But anyhow, he wound up in the camp and almost was then deported. I was lucky. Yeah, it was a close call. Huh? It was a close call that you weren't yeah, you're getting caught without the star. So as the, um, as the war started to come to an end and the Russian front came closer and closer, you were yes, also in town too. Well, when did we know the war was almost over? We worked at the barracks, SS barracks. And one day, what did we see? Um, some trucks, five or six trucks, slowing down the street, pushed by SS men. Oh boy, we were delighted. Oh, because. If even the SS didn't have any gasoline, then the days of the Third Reich must be over soon. And then, of course, what happened with the tank? Yeah. And then, what happened just <coughs> shortly before the end of the war? We were sent to an area, to a place where they had to build the foundations for a new Berlin after the war. The Russians already were on German soil. The West was already in Germany, but for some time we were building uh, foundations. But, but then, after a couple of, what's about two weeks, we were sent to the southern part of Berlin to build tank traps. The boys uh, close to a canal with tank traps, uh, dig, uh, dug ditches, put in. Uh, beams, 25 degrees, and there we worked about a day or two. And, uh, well, but they let us go. And we left, we looked at what we have done, and thought, well, how long will it take the Russians to get through? Well, we figured out 31 minutes. Why 31 minutes? Well, the tanks will come to the tank traps. The uh, uh, the drivers will laugh for 30 minutes and it will take him one minute to go through our traps. <laughs> we didn't do a very good job. However, 
actually the what we did was actually quite fortunate, our poor work, because the southern parts, two armies came to Berlin, east from the east, Marshal Zhukov, and uh, there was another army coming in from the south, and they came in very fast. They didn't have time to do anything to us, the Jews, and the western and southern part wasn't destroyed as much as uh, the eastern part. Perhaps she did a little bit for the liberation of Berlin. So the war ends, you survive, yes. your parents survive, as I you found out later, most of your... Russians came in, I, I had many ways of getting some bread by that time, still was taken off. The Russians came in and again looked at me and said, oh, I must be a soldier, all Jews are. But I showed them the star and uh, you know, they let us go. It seemed that we had survived the Third Reich. Of course, it wasn't even rosy afterwards, but... Uh, so even, even the Red Army soldiers were surprised to find, to find surviving Jews in Berlin at the end of the war. Need the room for my, but of course, and one uh, uh, person who lived and you knew enough Russian to explain why we were still around. And then, of course, it took some time. It wasn't the, uh, the aftermath was quite uh, rough. wasn't much food, and uh, Berlin was destroyed. And there, uh, too, what has happened to, uh, right before the war, we lived with uh, two other people in an apartment, three other families, and. No water, and of course there's still some pumps. And you had to go out and get the uh, get some water. Waited for a while. The bombing ran out with two buckets to the fountain, to the pump. Got some water. Hoped there was no. Ran back. The uh, bomb came in. You dropped to the ground. Spilled most of, most of the water. Went back. Refilled it. And there's still, at that time, there's still the Goebbels distributed uh, the tabloid, green tabloid, saying, Berlin remains, will remain German. Just like the Frankfurt at the gates of Berlin, the Russians will be defeated at the gates. And like, like uh, Napoleon at the gates of Moscow, the right, Russians will be repeated at the gates of Berlin. But uh, it, then, of course, it was uh, occupied by the Russians and the Western powers. If there was dark bread, we knew the uh, Russian was in charge. Next, uh, once the administration uh, changed to the Western powers, was white bread. And it, uh, Yes. The road out of, out of the war was a little bit steeper than thought, but uh, they're glad it was over. One of the experiences you talk about too is uh, going back to school after the war, yes. especially not only being going back to school with That's Jewish and non-Jewish students going together. To school. Of course, after three years, school was started again. The occupying powers was very important for them to start the uh, schools again. And I remember coming back and sitting again. After three years, can't you imagine? All uh, math and Latin and uh, English had to start again. And, and, uh, I, and uh, getting the right teachers only teachers had to be cleared politically. And it took quite some time to get a history teacher. 
he had been banned to the suburbs going away because he couldn't who, uh, follow uh, the line the Nazi way. And, uh, and of course, at that time, with uh, lights, the uh, electricity was shut off at certain points. And uh, I get off my, there was no light at home. And uh, what did I do? The subway was running slowly again. Well, I took my uh, homework and did it by driving back and back, back and forth in the subway. You can't imagine what that did to my handwriting. But, mm -hmm. And then, so in, it's, it was 1948, you decided to emigrate to the United well, States. Well, I think I got, in, got in better, but I felt that I might leave. It's my duty to rebuild Germany, and I decided to go to the immigrant. My father, mother, of course, hated to see me go, but my father said, look, I'm 60 years old. If I were younger, I would go with you. But what I can do over there, nothing. The law is completely different. This is it is based on old English law. Here is German law on old German law. But you go. But he said, I hope you will take a profession that is not limited to one country. Like law, and so I did. Could you talk a bit about some of your uh, new life, your first experiences in the United States? Yes, uh, I still remember. Uh, I came in in the morning. It was first dawn, and I saw uh, uh, cars up and down, and I wondered what what happened to me. Full of hope, and then in New York. But uh, you see the traffic there, you see these stores, windows full of uh, stuff you actually could buy. And I imagine, I never forget, there were packages piled up next to, to the mailboxes. And I thought, wait a minute, what is going to happen? You let the boxes here? Well, they said, mail theft is a federal crime, isn't worth the risk. And uh, actually, fortunately, uh, I had uh, learned English, was grateful to my English teacher. And uh, some people said, OK, we don't, we, we learned in the countries. But at that time, they gave us, uh, the organizations that brought us over, they gave us $10 spending money. And at that day, $10, can you imagine, it was quite something. And I went to the movies, and afterwards I feasted in all night uh, cafeterias. And uh, then came the day, actually they stayed in the hotel waiting until we were sent inland. Because we waited until the Jewish organizations in several organizations in various countries had agreed to uh, uh, take care, to help the immigrants. And I was called in and said, well, this time you have the choice between Detroit and uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, and you recommended the latter one. Well, and I choose Minnesota. I knew it would be very cold in Minnesota, but I hadn't heard yet that there's only two seasons, July and winter. But <laughs> actually, pretty close. And uh, they sent me off. I remember when the train to St. Paul was late, and uh, the next uh, train to St. Paul, uh, only we had to wait until the afternoon. The good ladies called St. Paul, the Egan's in Port Paul, and then said, don't stay close here in the bad neighborhood of the station. They went downtown, goes to the museum, and then 
I went next to took the train to St. Paul. And how unimpeded, imagine, just a small suitcase and a back patch. That was wonderful. And, uh, and after that, I uh, started work. Janet uh, in the hospital and then worked in the refrigerator company. And then afterwards, uh, a time I was able to enter the University of Minnesota. And I, he treated me very well. Never forget, of course, he, it was important for me to get uh, a resident status. Otherwise, I could fall in a court. It was caught in to the uh, board of uh, uh, the board had decided whether I could uh, should have uh, uh, out of state uh, fees. It was very actually very matter of fact, but friendly. And after asked me, what, explain why I should not have out of state fees, and uh, explained that I came to Minnesota not to study, but to live, and so he granted me the regular fees. And could you talk a little bit about um, your experiences at the Hillel House and? I, at the Hillel House, some of your experiences yeah, I, really shaped the future I, of your life. I was lucky. I was arranged to hit the fairest uh, student, uh, religious uh, organization of the Hillel House, and uh, I got the job there as assistant uh, caretaker. And, uh, I remember. It was quite interesting. Got used to uh, um, my fellow students, and uh, I remember what happened one day. There was a uh, festival, a Purim festival, and they had a, a pie throwing contest. The pies were thrown in somebody's face. And they were very upset, and they didn't know why. Why is he got so excited? Well, the rabbi came by and he asked him. And he explained to them that I lived in times where food was very rare and very precious. That made me very sensitive to And something else too, something very important happened. Um, the, it was the Hill House. And uh, I was there, uh, he came, I was um, meeting there, and uh, I was taking care of there was cooking in the kitchen and I explained to the people there are two dishes and for conservative Jews have two sets of dishes. One's for meat and one for milk, but you don't mix them up. And I told him to be careful and they come back, they're all mixed up. Well up to one was a pretty redhead and she asked, tell me about it. He talked well, and we became friends. And about a year after, we married. And says a saying, "Meet your spouse at the Hiller House." And so I did. It's a great story, Fred. Thank you. So um, we—it's about eleven fifty-four. We have some time for some um, questions um, from the from the audience. Um, then Fritz will close the program since the last few words. So there are two microphones out. Um, could you please ask your question um, using the microphone so that we all can hear it? I'll repeat the question so that Fritz hears it. And if you could please try to keep your questions as brief as possible that, so that more people can ask. So is there any questions from the audience? Thank you for coming. Um, I was wondering if you had a reaction to um, the march in Charlottesville last year by the um, white nationalist mm -hmm. people. 
Did that remind you at all of, of the precursors to what you saw in Germany? He was, he's asking if um, your, how you reacted, or your thoughts about the uh, march in Charlottesville last year with some of the, if it was, reminded you of, of events that you had experienced. Yes, that. I realized actually all of the, uh, it was a vague memory, but I hoped that that's what had been. Uh, there wouldn't be any repeats of it. That would be a single incident, and that would not happen again. But yes, it brought back memories, and that's what I guess people haven't learned. Thank you. Maybe you were uh, a small child at the time, but I would like to know if you remember what was the Nazi propaganda at the time of the election to get people to actually vote for them. Um, if you, if you could remember some of the, what was some of the propaganda that the Nazis used at that time to get people to vote for them? He realizes you might have been a bit young for that. Propaganda to get Jews? To get the people to vote in, 30, in the 30s. And that might be tough because he was born in 26, so he would have been, well, you know, seven. Actually, at that time, of course, the, after the war, people felt uh, the of the First World War, Germany had to pay, pay reparations. And there was quite a bit of uh, uh, people uh, out of jobs. And they did a lot of, uh, and lots of promises to, look, we are going to uh, get jobs. And uh, of course, they actually succeeded. And, uh, and there were lots, at that time, people were trying to get something else. At that time, the, uh, under the Weimar Republic, things were pretty drab. And the great promises. And just, uh, people went. So for, we, the, the museum did a special exhibition on propaganda. It's now, it's, I believe it's a traveling yeah, exhibition, propaganda. but we have an online exhibition, State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda, on our website. You should check that out. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, as you said, the Russians were surprised that you were still in Germany. And I am too, like, what do you think that was about that you and I don't, I, how many people were, how many Jews were kept in Germany? Because I'm surprised to hear that any were there as that was the center of the war. So she was saying, she was, uh, you're talking about how the, the Red Armies were very surprised to find you and your father. Yes. She's as curious as if you could just elaborate a bit more on that about your status. I mean, a lot of that was the fact that he came, his mother was Christian, so they fell under different rules. Um, had they been, had his mother been Jewish, then they would not have fallen under those, yeah. those regulations and they would have been deported. That was it. Okay. That so was, that's the real main thing. There were people like him there that were. Would work there. Yes. That was why. So I believe in your work company, that was primarily also um, Gelt, uh, the, the counted as Jews. No, actually not Jews. Jews too. Gelt was soon and. Uh, just the, the Jewish men, all Jews. Yes. Oh, but they were married to. Were they all married, married to, to German uh, to Christian. No, not the uh, the the other yes. Jews that were married in the marriages. Okay. Right. Thank you. This was all. Uh, some had to wear the star. That you, the co-workers said that married in the marriage had to wear the star. The ones that had children that were raised Jewish had read a star, and the ones that uh, had children that were not raised Jewish, they did not have to read a star. Okay. 
but Thank they're you. all uh, in the merit. Thank you. I have time for one more question. That's what I say. Uh, you, you mentioned about the, uh, the Russian army. I was wondering if you recalled the very first American military man you saw. Do you remember the very first time you saw a military GI or someone from the American military? What? Do you, re and, and after the war, do you remember the first time you saw an American GI? Yes, I remember. We came, first we moved to a suburb, western suburb, and we assigned a, a, a apartment in the house, and the first Russians, and one day they were the Americans. In fact, one American came around in a jeep looking around what houses to uh, take for the, uh, for the army. I remember I came by and I talked to him. And I told him, I live here, I hope he would not requisition the house we lived in. But he said, no, no. No, he came in pretty fast. Actually, I would say, no friend, are they well? Great surprise. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for attending this program. Um, I do hope you come back. We'll have first person every Wednesday and Thursday, and it's our tradition to give the first person the last word, but beforehand, I'd just like to let you know if, the, if you didn't get a chance to ask Fritz a question to, right now, um, after the program, he will be signing copies of his book. Um, all proceeds from the book do go to the museum. Um, and um, you can get a copy of the book signed. You can just ask a question. You can say hello. You can take a picture with him, whatever, you, whatever you'd like to do. And um, with that, I would like to turn the program back to Fritz for the, for the last word. Sorry for catching you mid-drink. <laughs> <clears throat> it was my good fortune to come to the United States. And I am forever grateful for the help I received and the opportunity given to me. I hold my, my American citizenship is very important to me. And uh, I'm often asked what I have learned, what's our main experience. And they say, don't do to others what you do not want done to yourself. And then I say, do it now. Don't put it off. Make that visit. Make that call. Write that letter. If you have a dream, go after it now. Don't put it off. And if you have two bottles of wine, drink the better one first. <laughs> <laughs>